Good evening. <laughs> Welcome to the Tuesday, May 14th, 2019, regular Board of Selectmen's meeting for the town of Berwick. Um, all the selectmen are here except for Rebecca. She, Rebecca is uh, traveling for work right now. Is, uh, we have town manager, town clerk, the superintendent of the schools, and uh, various members of the public. Please stand with me and salute the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. First order is the approval of the April 23rd minutes. I move the minutes as presented. Second. Any discussion? No. All those in favor? Thank you. It is a first public comment period. If you have a public comment, please step to the podium, state your name, where you live. Louisa Sheldon, 65 Sullivan Street. Um, regarding the planning board meeting of May the 2nd, um, where I brought up and discussed the application that was presented to the board for the 71 Sullivan Street parking lot situation. It was stated that um, you had not done your due diligence and were going to cease parking there until other measures were done to rectify this problem that we have of no correct permit that was issued. To date, um, cars are still there. Um, Saturday, there was about 85, 86 cars parked there. Um, those are the ones that were stationary. Um, doesn't include who was coming and going all day long. And um, I also sent an email, I think it was May the 4th, to the town manager and others involved, all involved, have not re received a reply. Um, is there anything you can do to tell me how I can get um, a reply? Um, I didn't receive your email. Is, is, um, is, uh, so I heard that through the town manager that you had sent an email out, but I have not seen it. Is, um, is as far as responding, is, um, I planned on responding being at the planning board meeting when it came up again. You know, and that one, when I was going to address it again. Okay. Um, that night, um, our town manager stated that he didn't want to cease the parking, and first you agreed to it, I believe, <coughs> and then you said that you would poll your board. I told so. the board on uh, Friday. I sent a report out to the board and okay. told them what happened and what uh, we were going to do. Hey, Steve, put your mic on. No action's been taken except for the fact that as we had been allowed on that site before, uh, we, I asked uh, the baseball groups if they could keep it to 22 people. Uh, and uh, I have no way of poli policing that, so I was hoping that they would police it themselves. But uh, it's a very busy group of people, like I said at the planning board meeting. If you had 80 cars there, there were probably another 45 or 50 down at the other parking lot. Now let me ask you how the people on Sweetser Street and in that neighborhood would feel if they had all 80 cars down there parking so they could see their children or grandchildren play ball. And it's, a, and it's public property, so. Okay, so that's your answer. You that's my answer. You did not pull the board and you refused to get a legitimate permit issued. Is, is that what you're they're, saying? They're working on it to getting a permit. It's a Who's conditional permit? use, and right now it was being used as was allowed at the time when it was, uh, the sober home was there, it was 22 cars, and it has not been changed since. So at this point, um, until uh, we get it surveyed, we are gonna get it surveyed and have an engineering uh, group take a look at it to see how we need to set it up to for drainage and stuff like that. I have not got a price back from them this week. He said he get to me this week, but I haven't heard yet. So we will have it surveyed and, and a plan laid out so it goes with, uh, give it to uh, our planner so he can present it to the planning board. 
Do you have a time frame for this? I don't. He said he'd get back to me this week with a price. And I have not heard back from him. And that's the engineering firm? Yes, the one who was here on uh, Thursday night when the planning board was here, Blaze Engineering. Are you talking last Thursday yes. or this upcoming? No, last Thursday at the planning board meeting. Okay. All right. So you're not going to reply to the email that I sent? I think this is a see? reply. I, I can't. I'm not doing anything. Okay. You're not doing point. anything, but you say there's a permit in process. There's not a, the only thing that's in process right now is a conditional use is before the planning board. Okay, and that's for the public hearing that's still open. So no permit has been issued to date, am I correct? No permit for 71 no, Sullivan Street? There's no permit's been issued. Okay, all right. That's it for tonight. Um, will there be, um, does the planning board meet this Thursday, May 16th? Yes, I believe so. Anybody know if this topic is on the agenda? It's not. So it's been continued? Okay. And nothing is being done to restrict parking or control parking or drainage? No. Right? Nothing's being done. Okay. May I ask why? Because Are you going to stick to the, the town owns it? The town owns the property and it can be used for parking, uh, overflow, for uh, the baseball and other youth programs. Any other public comment? <coughs> Seeing none, we carry on. Uh, reports of committees. Uh, I know Terry had yep. given Steve something for the uh, BCTV. Um, BCTV has moved into their new space completely. Uh, all the remodeling is done, and she says here the track lighting, and this green space, and uh, has all been uh, is being trimmed out. Um, it's quite a nice space, much more room for them to operate and get in their equipment and uh, utilize uh, the growth that we're seeing. Also, uh, they purchased a new Mac uh, with all the accessories to do a lot of editing and a lot of other work. Um, and let's see, the new station is, uh, is ready to be received and transmitted. Um, and we are just waiting to hear from Brian Christensen from Comcast what that channel is going to be so people can log into it. Uh, Diamond Hill and Little River Road, and that was part of our franchise agreement to expand our uh, cable out that way, and that has been completed. So if people on that road, if you don't know it's been completed, it is now, and if you'd like to get uh, cable TV and internet, you now have access to it. Um, Terry Wright was elected as the treasurer for the community television group. Um, for a three-year position, and that's CTAM, for the Community Television Association of Maine, so it's a statewide program. Um, it's a three-year position, and their goal is to get out information to other uh, television stations, public access TV, to uh, get on board and make sure that they don't lose that privilege of getting things out at no cost. And, and what else? She wants to let you know that uh, if you turn to uh, channel 22 or streaming on Saturday evening around 7 p.m., uh, BCTV will be going live for the biannual citizenship awards. Uh, this is something that the American Legion does every year, and it's time to every other year. Uh, and it's time to recognize Berwick residents who go above and beyond to help our town and our community. So that's a report from BCTV. In Bridget Berwick. Hey, James Wilson, Chair of Envision Berwick. Um, so, one of the big ticket items that our committee's got going on is a town wide branding effort. And we'll have a lease from Pixels and Pope. Elise is out of um, she's a Berwick resident. And she shared some um, really cool, she's got two branding concepts, which includes logos. And it's stuff that you'll, you'll see that you can get, we can get t-shirts, mugs, um, um, website materials, um, letterhead materials, uh, and it ties in with um, like 
a uniform si signage, wayfinding signage around town as well. Uniform color. It's 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 pretty. Um, she she did a great job. So it'll either be your next meeting or the meeting after that where we'll start rolling this out and we'll have two different directions that we can head in to make make that happen. Um, we met last night for an outdoor concert series. Captain um, Jerry Locke has been uh, a huge help and we're moving that project forward. Again, it's August 3rd, August 24th from 5 to 8 p.m. We've already got two bands booked, country band and a classic rock band. And um, we're gonna have Sullivan Street closed and we're gonna have the Tritown Bookmobile and the uh, Berwick Library is gonna be there and um, the Legion's gonna be there as well. And um, any other community organizations that wanna be a part of it, they're, they're welcome to come. And um, so I think the town in Vision Berwick, a lot of us have really been trying to move prime forward. There is a, um, a mix of developers and contractors and investors that have seemingly come out of the woodwork lately. And it seems like there's a lot of things that are coalescing. Um, and and Chris, Chris came up from Texas tonight. Um, he's after Steve on, on, the, on the agenda. And I think he has um, maybe a piece to the puzzle. So I'm looking forward to his presentation. You, you guys, any, any questions for me? Or? No. Doing a good job. Not yet. Thanks. Thank you, James. Thanks, James. Thank you guys, yeah. We have no department reports. Uh, we have appointments, presentations, and other guests. Um, we'll go through the appointments. I would like to move, after we go through the appointments, is um, there's been a request to move the abatement up before the presentations. Is uh, I was told it was going to be just a quick thing, and uh, you know, rather than have them sit through the abatement. So uh, we'll go through our appointments. Is uh, We have Sandy Sokol. From the recreation for the recreation commission for a three-year term. Hi. How are you doing? Introduce yourself. Tell us um, why you want to be doing this. Yeah. All right. I'm Sandy Sokol. We've been in this town since 2006. We have a 13-year-old son that has been in the rec, rec field since he's four years old. So I've been around this town for that whole thing, and I feel like that I can come in here with an open look to see what we can do to make this just a little bit better. So I know a lot of the people, I know a lot of the kids. I know you're going that one point. And I, I just, I'm, I'm excited to do something for the town. So that's pretty much the reason why I'm here. And I'm gonna learn as I go. Any questions for Sandy? No. Cool. No, thank you for volunteering. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Do we have a motion? Uh, this is a three year term. So I would move that we accept uh, or appoint Sandy Sokol to the Recreation Commission for a three year term. I don't have the end date on that. Uh, we'll just say three-year term. I'll second it. Any further discussion? No. no. All those in favor? Thank you very much. We Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for stepping forward. Appreciate it. Thank you. Um, is, uh, Dustin isn't here. We'll skip over him just for a minute. But Jennifer McCabe, uh -huh. the Deputy Code Enforcement Officer. <laughs> Come on. We were going to make you get up in you front. You didn't tell me this part. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you speech, right? I'll, I'll do a quick introduction. There are uh, no speeches. Uh, Jennifer uh, applied originally for, when we had an opening for code enforcement. And we interviewed her as one of the several candidates. And we got so excited about her energy and drive. And, uh, and she wants to be a code enforcement person. So. Uh, we decided to squeeze her in part-time to work with Dan and uh, she's passed almost all the tests for code enforcement so she's a eager beaver uh, <laughs> type A personality she just goes for it and she's been working with Dan since she's been here and he has been a great mentor to her as she learns the ropes so as she's at a point where she's been able to sign permits so in that place, we have to make sure that the state is notified that we have uh, her as a deputy uh, code enforcement. Code enforcement. Yeah. Yep. So, <coughs> Anything you you'd like to add? Her questions. Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. It, yeah. it, you don't. You don't want to speak in public, but you want to go meet the public and be in a code enforcement. I don't mind meeting the public, but no, this is definitely not my thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, 
<laughs> well, we'll keep you up there for a while longer. How's that? Right, yeah. I could, I'll just stand yeah. here all night. I have a little thick skin. Is there, has everybody met her before? Yeah. 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 yeah, I've, I've met with her. Familiar. Any any questions? Nope. Oh. Congratulations on uh, all, passing all your tests. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Or most of them, anyway. <laughs> I guess you're almost there. Yep. Is, uh, we need a motion. We need a motion. So I would move that Jennifer McKay be appointed as a deputy code enforcement officer um, without term. I'll second it. Any further discussion? Nope. All those in favor? Thank you guys so much. Oh, thank, thank you. you. We appreciate all your work you're doing for us. Um, and we have Dustin Price you know, for the Sewer District Board of Trustees for a three year term. Dustin couldn't be here tonight. Um, we all know him. I know Dustin. Is, um, he works in the Portland Sewer District, yep. I believe. He's, so he's got a strong background. He'd be. Thank you. And he's. I think he's. Is he filling a three year term or is he going to fill. Um, well, Lisa John England's up. position, because that's the position. Oh, I thought he was taking over for Lisa. I yeah. thought it was just to John England, but... I'll have to check that. Why check, you'll Lisa, have to check that. Why is Lisa getting done? She had, this done. is end of this year. Oh, is that... Yeah. 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 She, she's dealing a lot with her parents, and she doesn't have the time anymore. Well, I'll have to check. If it's for John England, I'll have to check when his term expires, and then... It He's got one year left, back. I think. One year, one year left. Yeah. Okay, so let's change it to one year, and then. Should we table this it. until we figure that out, or? Yeah. No, we know it's. We're pretty confident it's one year. Yeah. One year term. Yeah, I, I believe. I believe in his original letter to us. It, he said something about filling in for John England in the original letter. So is, um, is that that was the position that was open when he was, uh, you know, wrote to us, and you no, know, Lisa decided just this last week that she wasn't going to be running again. So is. Um, is, I, I feel I feel good at you know, appointment for a one year term. If that's I can go check too. Yeah. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I already heard the yeah. presentation, so I can run over and check that. Yeah. Um, this is the pleasure of the board. I'd like to know what I'm proposing before. Okay. okay. We, 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 we can we can table it. We can table it. So. Is, um, um, and if there is no objection, is uh, I'll move the uh, abatements up before the uh, presentations. Is uh, Ryan Michaels from 215 Long Swamp Road. Let me pull the paperwork. <clears throat> How are you? How are you doing? Very good. good. Right, I'll, I'll read. I'll read what the uh, from Paul, our uh, assessor, said. The prop subject property is a ranch-style single-family dwelling on 2.51 acres. The owner is concerned that the property is overassessed due to discrepancies on the property card. During cyclical review, it was estimated that the property had an in-law apartment, and the front portion of the dwelling was finished living space. At the owner's request, an interior and exterior inspection was completed, and it was discovered that there were discrepancies on the property card. After corrections were made, the assessed value decreased $11,100 from $261,800 to $250,700. It is recommended that an abatement be granted in the amount of $195.36. Um, Sure. Is anything you'd like to add? Uh, yeah. Um, so as promised, I'll make it very quick, and I appreciate the time. I've always wanted to be a part of something like this. Unfortunately, I have to scoot in and scoot out. So to give you a little bit of uh, background, uh, I'm from Presque Isle, Maine, the county, and i um, been down here for about, well, actually, I purchased this home in 2015. Uh, I have seven children, two biological, and uh, five stepchildren, right? So busy, and I've got 70 hours. I work at Pratt & Whitney Salaried. I'm also a Maine Army National Guardsman, and I travel 175 miles north and then back once a month and two weeks a year, and additional training at that. Um, so very busy, nonetheless. So with all of that said, this is my first home I've ever bought. I'm 26 years old. I bought this in 2015. In the cyclical review, as mentioned, uh, every four years, I think, they go through and, and check everything. Oh, and, stuff. That, <laughs> well, and they did, you know, which is good. Yeah. Uh, but apparently they checked it literally like two weeks after I bought it. And I had, again, my first home, you know, and I didn't start digging into this until uh, towards the end of last year. 
thinking when my, my neighbor split the house in, in two, or the land in two, and he lives here now, and now I live here, and he paid a total of $4,000 for his taxes a year as that was you know brought up when we were purchasing the house and doing all the paperwork. And I'm currently paying, it was like upwards of 5000 now alone, let alone it was 4000 before, so that sparked a question, so I started digging. Um, and the more I started digging, I found that I was paying uh, for something after I purchased the house two weeks after they did a review saying, hey, you have an in-law apartment, and hey, you have a kitchen, a second kitchen. I never have had that ever, ever. And so I'm like, wait a minute, what? So when I call in, they said, well, what we can do is I'd suggest uh, setting up something where we can come out and we'll uh, assess your property. And we'll take a look and see if we're wrong. And if that goes through, take this, take it to the board, because uh, from what I understand, you guys also, you do the assessing as well. Uh, so take it in front of you guys to show that, hey, this is what happened, and then ask for the previous years. I know it's usually the one-year mark, but at the end of the year last year, they told me to go through this. Or is it Paula? There, Paul, Paul Karen. Paul. Sorry, Karen is who I was oh, speaking Karen with. Was, uh, I had recommended I take this, and then the next step would be to, to come in front of you guys. So really, I'm looking for the three years previous. This has already been taken care of, but I'm looking for the three years previous. Um, yeah. Just because, I mean, it's black and white that they came in, or someone came in and thought there was an in-law, thought there was a second kitchen, but there really never was one, ever. Um, it's just not possible. It'd have to be extra plumbing. There'd be a whole bunch of things that just were never there. Uh, so just looking to see if I can get reimbursed for the three years prior, from 2015. And there should be a date on here somewhere. I purchased the house December 9th, 2015, and I think the cyclical review is literally within two weeks after that, or minimum within a month after that. Did you approach the assessor as well about the three years prior? Did you mention that to him when, when this application was submitted? Uh, so I've never actually spoken. To, the only person I spoke to is uh, Karen when I called to ask about this, okay. and then she recommended to get an assessor out there. I think she, does she assess too? She, I think she, she went out there then, and she went out there in January, and then ever since then it's just been a game of trying to find out how do I take the next step. I think it was last week I came in to register my car, and I finally caught Karen, and I said, hey, what do I do? She suggested I come here. Um, she was kind enough to try to recommend me to fit in earlier because I know it was a big schedule today, but I was I just trying to get this out of the way as soon as possible. Sure. But uh, when they came to do this, obviously, you know, I didn't know I wasn't there. It was one of those things where they came in, I wasn't there, so, you know, the assessment was done, and, yeah. and I didn't find out until later. Okay. And Karen said to me that they would only request the one year back to you guys because of the law. Right. So it would be up to the homeowner to come and request. And that's why she had suggested to take this after. So, so you, you, your original, we, we already, we already okayed the original one year. Th this one, and she told me to yep. take this one, which is here approved and yep. already 195 submitted. But to take this and show, hey, you know, this was an issue on us. This was a property card discrepancy, and now with this, I would ask for the, ever since that discrepancy was started, which was again very shortly after I purchased the home. So for three years, I would have paid the additional amount for something I didn't own or have. We don't typically go back for three years, if I remember correctly. Yeah, I'm not sure. I don't remember. It's usually on the poverty or abatement. You don't go back three. Yeah. Um, this would be a question for Paul or Karen. Yeah, I, I'd like to speak to Paul about this. I think you can agree. I don't think it should be an this? issue, considering it's a, mis it's a mistake, mistake on yeah. our part. So, uh, but I'd like to make sure we take the appropriate channels Absolutely. To, to verify and do yeah. it uh, yeah. uh, correctly. I would go with this one, and she'll have to write something up because we have yeah. to have a record. Well, this one's already been taken care of. We already right. yes. this one. Back in March. All you got to do is approve this. No, this already has been approved. Yeah, yeah. Has been approved. yeah. 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 we approved it back in March. Right. Right. Yeah. That's why it looked really created. familiar. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And that's why she said to use this approved one to go back and show exactly what you said. It is a mistake, right. and it is owned here, and this would be... You know, a way to voice that, hey, this is why it's okay to do this, I guess is lack of better words. Um, yeah, we, we would like to talk to the assessor, you know, and, and uh, find out, you know, from him what he, he suggests and stuff, you know, directly. So, um, is, uh, we'll table it for now and uh, I think we should be able to get you a response fairly quickly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Are you saying from Karen or the person who originally assessed you mean? I'm you, confused either one, too. Karen. I'll, I'll, okay. We can speak to Karen. Karen she'll be in Wednesday, yeah. and uh, she'll give us an answer. Yeah. You can ask her. 
and then and, we uh, just need another one of these. And yeah, we should we should have an answer for you by uh, our next meeting. In okay. Two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Yep. yep. And I'll just, I'll come to this next one, just like this one. Okay. Yep. Um, the one thing she mentioned too, and again, it, either way, it's a win-win if it you know comes in my favor. But she had mentioned this could either go on my um, what's it called there? Pay your mortgage uh, escrow. Does it go into escrow, or can that be given in check form as well? She had mentioned it was one option or the other, but she had put it's it automatically into escrow. I'm not complaining because yeah. it comes in. It's helpful well, either way. What we can do is apply it towards the next tax bill. Correct. So that's typically what we would do. We would credit your account. Okay, and that's the only option. Okay, it's fine. She she mentioned check or that, which I'd yeah, prefer check I if I could, check but. With the finance director, if he'd be willing to cut a check. Okay, that would be my preferable option, but either way. That an abatement. Yeah. Anyway, so. Great. Well, thank awesome. you. Thank you so much. I do yep. appreciate it, and I apologize. I wish I could problem. stay. I heard your speech is going to be awesome. I'm just oh, saying. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have, have a good guys. night. All right, have a good night. Yep. I do have uh, John England's term, according to the town report last year, which I know is accurate, on uh, June 2020. 2020. The next year. The next year. One year term. So it's a one year term. Yeah, term. This is for Mr. Price. Right. Yeah. So, should we look at your, your chair? <laughs> <laughs> you, you, yeah, you, that, you, that satisfy you? Satisfies uh, me. Right. Is, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll backtrack uh, back to the Dustin Price on the Sewer District trustees. So I would move that we uh, uh, appoint Dustin Price to the Sewer District Board of Trustees for a one-year term ending in June 2020 as, uh, as presented to us. Second. Yep. I'll second it. Is, uh, all those in favor? Very good. Now, Steve Connolly is superintendent of MSAD 60. Uh, I thought uh, Jennifer McCabe was going to stick around and give this speech for me, but apparently not. Um, she doesn't like to speak with parties. And, uh, so the, uh, we, we had the, the budget meeting last week yeah. up at the high school, yeah. and uh, the everything passed that and moved on to the voters for the June election. Yes, and just to give so. you, let's see, just to give you a little uh, heads up for oh, information-wise. Uh, that's okay, there's a page in there that I want to talk oh. about. And if you want to keep these, you can, or, or if you have a copy at home. And first, I'll take those back. Have a copy at home. For spares. <coughs> okay, so I'll be brief tonight. Did you hear that? Did you hear that? You. you can pass that on. <laughs> all right, so uh, first of all, you just have a copy of my notes. That's all that's in here, but uh, besides the uh, booklet itself. So obviously, thank you for the opportunity to present tonight. It's interesting to listen to the young man talk about his home at first home at 26. I have T-shirts older than him. All right, so that's never a good thing. Uh, the expenditures uh, on the page that you see on the right that this is open to um, would go uh, would be a total increase of 2.27. You see that at 41 million, uh, about 41 and a quarter million, and then you see that moving to 42 million 194 575 for 1920 for the budget expenditures, and then the revenue is largely flat for us this year. 18-19, we used uh, 1.165 million um, from fund balance. Um, it, there were projects that we had been putting off that needed attention and could not be put off further. So uh, we only have uh, 300, just a little less than 400,000 to use in the fund balance. So <coughs> overall, we have a decrease of, use, of usable funds there of uh, close to three quarters of a million dollars. The, um, the GPA, the general purpose aid that comes from the state is an increase of 730,000. And you see those two numbers largely offset each other. The local taxes required for the proposed budget, you can see in the bottom of this page, <coughs> and it lists it as an increase uh, from of 4.8%. And the reason that there's a difference between the 2.27 and a 4.8 that throws people off is because the 2.27 is on the entire 
budget, the all 18 articles, and the uh, the 41 mil 42 million, and the which includes the state subsidy, the GPA, and the bottom number is specifically about the local taxes portion, which goes from 19 million to 20 million 37,588. So an increase of 4.8 percent on that. Um, now, if you flip to the last page in the book, to the left of the pie charts, you'll see that the um, <coughs> you'll see the district formula. Now, you might compare those numbers to the ones that you receive from the state, and they talk valuation for for each of the towns. They don't use the same formula, interestingly enough, for the municipalities as they do for the schools, so there's a variation there, um, not terribly significant. Uh, the property, the Berwick valuation accounts for 34, about 34.5% of the uh, total for the three communities. The student count represents 44.5%, and so the average is 39.53, about 39.5%. Which it, oops, that should say, I'm sorry, it says the word decrease right there. Please cross out the D and put an in. Yeah, should have gone over it a fourth time, I guess. All right, so uh, an increase of point uh, of point one four, fourteen hundredths of a percent. The local revenue that that represents is an increase of $389,235. That's the taxes required for the proposed budget. Um, there are two separate articles this year. Usually there's w one, which is adult education. That for Berwick would be an increase of $7,440. And then school nutrition is pulled out separately um, beginning 1920 uh, budget, and that's an increase of $176. One of the uh, facts that I like to share with people on the bottom of this, uh, the, the inside cover, it says, uh, did you know? In 2017-18, this is about regular education students, not including special <coughs> education students. MSAD 60 had the lowest county, uh, the lowest York County K-12 pupil expenditure at $11,381. The York County average was 13401 and the state average was $12,198. And uh, we believe that the three communities uh, do an excellent job funding our schools to allow us to continue to make progress. So uh, we, we think that comparatively that it's a responsible budget. Um, you can see positions that were listed here on the bottom in number eight. And I just want to just want to look at the ones that are highlighted. First of all, in the it says MP social worker, multiple pathways. That's for students who are off track at the high school. Last year, we received a $750,000 grant from the Barr family in Boston who were interested in our work. And they would like to help us to expand the program and to do different modeling that we'd like to, to pursue but did not have the financial opportunity to do. Um, and so that's over a three-year period, 350 this year, 250 the next, and 150,000 in year three. Multiple pathways social worker was a position we hired last year and part of the grant is that we assume that position this year and for the coming school year. Um, so there's a social work position. Then there's a thing called second step. You'll see that listed two or three times in here and there are educational technicians to work on that program. That is a social emotional programming. So, so far we have a social worker. We have social emotional programming in each of the elementary schools. Um, we have a behavior intervention co coach, noticing any trends on those positions. We have a uh, second step, second step, and it's on the back side of yours. We have uh, a uh, full-time elementary social worker that will travel uh, during the week between three schools. The biggest changes that we have in our budget this year are cost-driven by new employment related to student profiles trauma-informed schoolwork, social-emotional programming, and behavioral interventionists. We are seeing a significant increase in the kinds of behaviors uh, at the earliest ages. Um, we are a microcosm of what's going on in society, and we see that there's, uh, we, we all know that there's a national epidemic occurring 
I spoke to this as well last year. And uh, when, when we were adding special education programming, significant kinds of programs, and these are regular education initiatives, but we're, we're still struggling with the same issues, that, um, that the school needs to take on more of a role in uh, setting the standards for um, basic conduct. Um, uh, just uh, as a side note. Uh, would, you, would you repeat yourself? What did you say, basic conduct? So, uh, is that what you call it, Steve? I, yeah, I guess I'd use, that's the term I was using. I was trying to carefully get through that. Um, so what <coughs> we're seeing is um, uh, there's, there's a little bit of decay in, in family structure that I believe is largely driven by the opioid addiction. And so when that translates over into how students conduct themselves at school, they're not having the modeling in uh. other settings uh, because families are struggling with, with uh, health and emotional issues. Um, coupling that, we know that uh, the latest statistic is that 50% of mental illness in 2018 was determined to be at under the age of 11. So they're identifying students at younger and young kids at younger and younger ages struggling with mental illness. So that's, um, that's a societal issue, and the schools need to obviously respond to that. that did, we didn't have that when we were in school. I mean, it just, I don't understand it. How come? Um, well, I'm not I trying think to get that, off track uh, here. I just, say I that again? I, I'm not trying to get off track. I just, I guess, I don't, why is that happening? Is it all because of the opioid epidemic? Well, epidemic? I, think that's, I think that's part of it. And I think that the, it may be one of the, to me, that's one of the larger drivers because when I'm talking with other people from other states in, yeah. at the, uh, um, uh, the American Association of School Superintendents, uh, part of my listserv communications back and forth with people is they're not seeing, uh, it doesn't matter if you're in Minnesota or if you're in San Diego, they're having exactly the same situations and they're building up these kinds of programming. So the second step is um, uh, really about self-regulation, that students are able to say, this is what it looks like for me to be in a community of other students, and these are the ranges that I can be operating in, and things can operate fine. But once I go outside of these, I need to think about self-regulation sk skills. So we're working very hard on those. Huh. Thank you. Um, you can see that uh, there's some data on the literacy proficiency. That's been a consistent goal of ours that we are hammering away on. Um, you can see that in the spring of 14, literacy proficiency in the third grade in, these are just Berwick stats, were, was at 60%. The spring of 15, when that same group moved to fourth grade, if you go across the, the scale, uh, the uh, graph, it was 65.6%, uh, so a 5.4% increase. And then in the spring of 16, that same, I used cohort, so I stayed with that same group of kids. Um, so it's, it's, the, it's nearly identical. 69.8% um, in the spring of 16. I don't go any further than the fifth grade on that piece because then they go to the middle school and their data gets uh, uh, configured differently into a pool of all three districts. The fourth grade at the time in 2014 was 52.5 percent proficiency, and in the spring of 15 it was 68.9 percent. And then you can see I ran another group um, that in the spring in the spring of 17 was 63 percent to 65.1, and then the spring uh, the spring of 19 we have in process at this time. Uh, and the fourth grade moved from 62.6 to 63.4. So our, our literacy trends are on the increase. Um, I'm very hopeful for this year's uh, next data point. Um, the, one of the factors that's influencing us, though, is we see a significant difference between students who are K-3 to Berwick students and students who are experiencing transiency. Is that a surprise to anybody? No. Somebody who's experiencing transiency is going to have upheaval in their lives, and when you have that upheaval, it's very hard to say that uh, school and learning is the major thing that you're thinking about as a, as a five, six, seven, eight, nine-year-old. 
um, you, you, you've got other things that are weighing on your mind and pulling, pulling your attention. Um, and we're seeing it, kids coming in to the district, for instance, from uh, New Hampshire, and we're also seeing kids moving out. Um, but when we disaggregate the data, uh, it, it's more favorable for the students who are with us consistently, not surprisingly. The math data has been flat. Um, we have used the everyday math for 20 years, done a lot of work with it. We believe it's run its course, and so we're going to be switching to a thing called Eureka Math, which is an open education. It's a free resource. Uh, there are things you can purchase to go with it, support tools, um, but it was paid for largely with federal dollars, so it's a free resource. We'll use that through the fifth grade. Um, and then at the secondary level, we'll, we'll use a different program. Um, Hussey Elementary School in the future, we've had meetings. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank BCTV, Terry, for coming out and taking tours with us in, in the rain or snow, depending on whenever it was, or in the icy conditions. Uh, that's, those presentations have gone well. We're looking at an expansion for Hussey. Uh, there will be a portable in the uh, back lot uh, for this uh, that will be placed there this summer. And then one last point before I see if you have any questions is I'd like to thank James for his consistent help. Any time that I send out like once a quarter pretty much, can you help me out and update the uh, building permits so I just can kind of get a feel for things. Uh, James is the first one that's on that. So I appreciate it. Thank sure. you. Yep. Any questions for Steve? June 11th. Yeah. Big day. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've got you folks. Uh, it's 8 to 8. Yeah. 8 to 8. Okay. Um, just a comment on the math. Yes. Is, you know, I'm dating myself, but we knew one math when I was a kid. Yeah. And starting when my children are in school and now my grandchildren, it seems like every few years they change math. Is, you know. Yeah. Well, math, it, math doesn't change. Yeah. The well, the, the numbers, the approach, yeah. the approach, the approach does, yes. to it. Yeah. Yeah. So, so like in uh, 2000, in the year 2000. It makes it hard um, for it to help with homework. <laughs> it, Let it, me tell does. You. <laughs> it does. It does. I don't know what that is. That's not much help. <laughs> I can tell you. You know, so I can do not. regular trigonometry oh. and stuff if I have to. But, but. but grampy, it's addition. I oh, don't know boy. what that. I've never seen that matrix before. Yeah. Um, in, in, two, in the year 2000, 83 percent of the students who took the SATs in the United States demonstrated a lack of basic proficiency on the um, on, in algebra. Algebra? Mm -hmm. Algebra. Yeah. And 100% and of the students had that subject in common as having been in their queue along the way. So it, it was very plain that uh, approaches were not paying off foundationally at the younger levels to continue the acceleration for kids. So necessary to, to look at different ways to try to build a stronger foundation. Any other questions? And those abacuses, Tom, they just they slide rules and abacuses. They're hard to get a hold of. I, I, I pulled out a slide rule the other day. <laughs> as, uh, my I grandsons got, didn't know what it was. I got very little to say. I really do. <laughs> I had the same thing. So. Still work, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Without batteries. <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you, Steve. All right. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. You too. And uh, <clears throat> next we have Chris Grisella, Grisella from, it says Buxton Conservation, but I don't think it's Buxton Conservation, is it? No. Are you, you going to do an overhead? Oh, he's going to do a presentation. Go to the church to get the thing to stay down. Are you going to pull it out a little bit? Yeah. All right, there we go. Yeah, you're going to pull it. Oh, oh hit that light. Yes, please.
give a quick introduction? Oh, sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so, like, so like I mentioned before, um, so I think um, Chris has we've been working together for, what, a year, year and a half, you were saying? You reached out a couple years ago. Um, he's, he's Actually, I talked with um, Ed, Ed we were, after the parade, I've kind of pitched you on this. Do you remember? A little bit. A little bit, yeah. So I think this is, will be a tool that, um, for one, I think the way that for funding this, and we've talked with some of the guys that are interested in developing Prime, that we could split split the cost, and, and Chris will get into the, the cost figures. But I think we're in an age of um, really intrusive data and really powerful data, and I think this really gets – this allows us to really supercharge our economic development um, powers. And uh, we've had – economic development committees that have kind of come and gone and I think we're at right at a right time where this this tool could really uh, supercharge what I do and what um, a committee could do and I, and I really think this could effectively um, would allow us to have an economic development director without having to pay a salary for one so I'll let uh, Chris can probably explain it better than I can so Chris Thank you, James, for that warm introduction. Uh, as James mentioned, my name is Chris Grisello with the Buxton Company, and I want to thank you all for allowing me to be here this evening. I'm really excited to introduce everyone to, to us here at Buxton and the services that we have in helping communities all across the country with their economic development goals. Uh, and as James mentioned, really taking more of a data-driven approach uh, towards their economic development goals. Um, and, and to bring everyone up to speed on the conversations that we've had the last year and a half, almost two years ago since I've reached out to Steve Eldridge um, about our services and how we're, we would be able to help the town uh, to bolster uh, their economic development initiatives uh, and really focusing, in, focusing on retail recruitment and business retention. Um, we help communities to create and implement an economic development strategy that's geared towards that retail recruitment and business retention. And it's because of the background that we have here at Buxton um, in working with retailers the last 25 years, and up to this point we've worked with over 4,000 different retailers um, with their site selection and with their growth. And so we've been able to take that um, experience and that knowledge and the data that we have in-house to help communities all across the country um, create an actionable plan. So tonight I'm going to introduce everyone to us here at Buxton and really get into the nuts and bolts to how we create that strategy, how we're, we would be able to position um, James and Stephen with an actionable plan when it comes to retail recruitment. Um, to get things started, we, we here at Buxton, we're a consumer analytics company, and it's important to get a better understanding of the background that we have in the retail industry, like I mentioned. Um, uh, the last 25 years, we've been privileged to work with over 4,000 different retailers. And as you can see here on the screen, there's a lot of national brands, but we've also worked with a lot of regional concepts, a lot of unique concepts that have two to three locations in their market that are looking to grow. The way that we help these retailers grow is by leveraging data, helping them to build a scientific solution to understand where should they plant their next flag. So when a brand like uh, Jason's Deli, O'Reilly Auto Parts, Marriott Hotels, when they're looking to open a new location, where are the company behind them that tells them exactly what market should they open up their next location? Um, and the approach that we take, it's more of a customer, customer, <laughs> customer approach. I know that uh, you, you may all have heard um, the approach of location, location, location. Well, these days it's not location, location, location. Because at the end of the day, you can have the best piece of real estate, but if you don't have the customers uh, to, to support your brand, you're not going to be successful. So that is why we're leveraging over 300 different data sets that go down to the household level to tell these folks, these brands, who their best customers are, where they and similar like-minded individuals are located, um, and the value that each one of these customers holds to their brand so that way they know exactly what market should they open their next location. So as I mentioned, because of that experience, we've been able to um, – uh, work with communities all across the country uh, to create an economic development strategy that's focused on retail recruitment and identifying the right type of retailers for their market. 
Now, to give you a better idea of the footprint that we have in the retail industry, I'd like to show just a quick snapshot of our performance uh, in a 12-month period. Our retail partners um, in this 12-month period, they leveraged our solution to identify uh, over 80,000 different sites that has a potential for their brand. Now, of those 80,000 sites, only 7,500 brick and mortar locations were open. So this gives you an idea, doing some quick math, that when a retailer is looking to open a new location in a region, they're looking at 10 to 15 different other markets. So as local leaders, you have to think to yourself, how do we stand out? As a community of 8,000 in population, uh, a small footprint, how do we stand out in front of those retailers to get them to locate into our market rather than uh, um, Rochester or, or any other surrounding communities um, in our region? It's about having a proactive uh, strategy. It's have, having a game plan and a strategy that puts Berwick on those retailers' radar to show to them that, hey, we have the customers that you are looking for. We know that you can be successful in our market as well. Uh, and telling a better story and a compelling story to get in front of those retailers and sell the community and sell the town to bring those amenities um, into Berwick. Now, as I mentioned, it's because of that experience that we have in the retail industry that has allowed us to, to be able to work with over 800 different communities the last 15 years. As I mentioned, we're working with communities to create and implement an economic development strategy that's geared towards retail recruitment and business retention. Uh, and, and we have experience in, in communities ranging in all shapes and sizes, different markets, different goals, different uniqueness, um, you know, uh, communities that are less than 2,000 in population. Uh, someone like a North Lake, Texas, who we're currently working with, um, a few years back, we helped them recruit a McDonald's. Uh, now we're looking to help them recruit more retailers into their community. Uh, McKamey, Texas, who is under 5,000 in population as well, we helped them recruit a family dollar. Uh, Ridge, Ridgefield, Washington. Uh, I know speaking with Stephen and speaking with James, I know a grocery store is something that a local leaders would love to bring into the community as well. So to give you an idea, we helped Ridgefield, Washington last summer recruit a 80-square-feet um, 80, 80 grocery anchored development. Uh, in this grocery store, um, it brought in 140,000 sales tax dollars just from construction alone, and it's bringing in a revenue of $220,000 uh, in sales tax back to the city every year that that grocery store is there. Um, but we're also working with bigger uh, footprint, um, as you can see here on the screen, uh, bigger footprint communities as well. Uh, Rochester, New Hampshire, right up the street, we're currently partnered with them. We're helping them. We've been partnered with them for over eight years now. Um, we've landed over 500,000 square feet of retail space for Rochester, working with Karen Pollard there. Um, Karen Pollard is no longer there. She's moved on. But uh, we're still partnered with the, with the city, evolving that strategy, identifying more amenities to bring into their, into their community. But no matter what community we're working <laughs> with, as I mentioned, no matter what vision you all have, um, we're, we're creating that vision and, and uh, putting validation to that uh, to the vision and assuring that you know we're going after the right type of retailers for the market and you know if we have aspirational goals into attracting the trader joes um you know we want to put some validation to say okay can berwick attract a trader joes if not what is the next best grocery store that is similar to a trader joes that also um uh, serves or or um, sells that Whole Foods type products that we can go after for the community. So we're spending our resources and our time um, to, to attract the right type of retailers and position ourselves uh, in, a, in the best light possible. Now, because of the background uh, and the success that we've had both in the retail industry and also working with over 800 different communities, we've been recognized uh, by a number of different, uh, different firms and different accolades that uh, we've received over the years. Uh, Fast Company placed us number two on their Fast 50 list. The National Retail Federation recognized our CEO as one of the people influencing the retail um, industry today. 
um, ICMA, um, the, um, the International City Managers Association. We have speaking sessions at this show every year to educate city managers, uh, local leaders throughout the country on how they can continue to be um, strategic when it comes to economic development. How can they leverage data? How can they best position their community for growth when it comes to retail development? And I shared these accolades with you, not to boast or to brag, but just to give you an idea that um, when, it, when it comes to Buxton and our name is highly re recognized in this industry when we're, we're going after those retailers. Now that's, that's a little bit of information of our background here at Buxton. Now really what I want to dive into is how we create that solution, how do we identify what our market truly looks like here in Berwick and how can we position ourselves uh, to attract more retailers. Now our solution is focused on two main components, retail recruitment and equally as important is business retention. How do we position our local businesses for success and for growth as well? Uh, with retail recruitment, we want to identify specific retailers that are currently not on the ground today that should be and then take that proactive data-driven approach to go after those retailers and streamline the process and getting them into Berwick. So instead of just sitting on uh, some prime real estate right across the street uh, with the prime development, instead of just waiting for developers to attract retailers, uh, we want to position local leaders with a playbook and an actionable plan to, to be proactive with retail recruitment and start having those conversations and start building relationships with the right type of retailers that we know can be successful in the town through that data-driven approach. Uh, with business retention, as I mentioned, we want to help you strengthen your local businesses by providing them data um, to help them better understand who their core customers are sp uh, specific to their business. Um, providing them data to help them understand the types of products and services uh, that the consumers are wanting and needing here in the town and the surrounding uh, market. We also provide them a tool, a very powerful tool called um, LSMX, which is short for Local Store Marketing, powered by powered by Buxton, which I'll get into um, later in this presentation. But what this tool does, it allows your local businesses to market to the right type of consumers specific to their brand. So I'm excited to show you that tool here in a minute. Uh, but our solution, um, the overarching theme, is to getting local leaders to think like a retailer. Understand how those retailers view the town of Berwick and being able to speak the same language and make a compelling case to those retailers on why they should locate into the town rather than any other surrounding communities. Um, so, you know, based on our experience, having worked with over 4,000 different retailers, there's a few variables that uh, we're going to take a look at to get that true um, understanding of what Berwick's retail potential is. The first thing that we're going to look at is the consumer profile. We want to understand every, every citizen as consumers. The folks that are living, working, playing in the town and the surrounding market, we want to understand how they live their lives and how they spend their money on a daily basis. We also want to identify what is that drive time trade area. Uh, for, for those that have worked in real estate or know a little bit about real estate, uh, you might think that uh, folks look at markets in terms of mile radiuses. Uh, they no longer look at uh, markets in mile radiuses. They look at it in drive time, um, uh, drive time trade areas. And the reason for this is because um, we as cons uh, citizens, um, you know, we we're, as consumers, I mean, we think in convenience. When we're thinking about going to lunch, uh, we're not necessarily uh, thinking about how many miles it takes us to get to that restaurant. We're thinking about how many minutes it's going to take us to get there and to get back. So that's the same way that a retailer is going to look at your market in terms of drive time. And they want to know how far is a consumer willing to drive to get to my specific brand. And within that drive time trade area that we look at for Berwick, whether that's 15, 20, 25 minutes away, depending on how we're pulling them, how far we're pulling them into the market, that's going to determine what type of retailers are looking for your market. I'm going to dive into that a little bit deeper here in a minute, uh, but we're also going to look at the, all of the thousands of other retail market conditions on the ground, such as competition, co-tenancy, traffic patterns, um, area draws, what those retailers like to be next to, all of those market conditions we're going to take in consideration in that deep dive analysis that we would do for Berwick. 
to hit on the consumer profile piece just a little bit further and why we want to understand each citizen as consumers and why why we take the approach of leveraging psychographic data and rather than just, than just leveraging demographic data. Um, as you can see here, my example is two households uh, that live on the exact same street. And then if we look at these households just from a demographic standpoint, um, they look exactly the same. They have the same gender, uh, they're around the same age, they have the same income. Well, with demographics alone, it doesn't tell me whether or not these individuals are going to shop in my store or dine in my restaurant. To, the, to, to retailers, it's not actionable information. So that's why here at Buxton, we harness the power of consumer analytics to tell the story on how exactly each one of your citizens lives their lives and spend their, spends their money. Now, we have over 350 different data sets that go down to the household level of each one of your uh, citizens and even the folks that uh, work in the area, the folks that are traveling uh, um, and the visitors that are just coming into um, Berwick. We can tell you exactly how they live their lives and spend their money. Now we get this data from a number of different um different uh, sources such as credit card data, uh, mos uh, mosaic uh, data, Experian data, uh, rewards programs, subscriptions you sign up to. So all of that data, um, you know, on a daily basis, everyone is leaving a trail of data behind on everything that you purchase, whether you swipe a credit card or you purchase online or you sign up for a different program online. Uh, it's for firms like us that take that data, harness it, and get answers uh, for to help communities, help retailers with their growth. Uh, now, going back to my example here, um, by leveraging psychographic data, we now can tell the difference between these two individuals and tell you exactly how they live their lives and spend their money. We have a Steve. We have a Jim. While Steve, he likes to work out twice a week, he likes to shop at Whole Foods, and he's interested in traveling, Jim, who lives right across the street, he lives his life significantly different. Jim, he eats fast food three times a week, he shops at Walmart, and he's more of a homebody. He does not like to go out as much. So um, right off the bat, we can see the uniqueness and differences between these two individuals by getting past demographic data. So when we're going out and talking to a, uh, as I mentioned earlier, Trader Joe's or some type of Whole Foods type concept, um, that, that, that brand is going to want to know where all the Steves in the market live because Steve is that specific brand's core customer. So because Steve likes to live uh, more of a healthy lifestyle and likes to eat, um, you know, more healthy food, um, that, that specific brand, we're going to be able to tell them exactly how many Steves we have living in the, in the market and if um, their specific brand could be successful based on the customers uh, in all of the market conditions that we've already looked at here for Berwick. So once we go through that comprehensive analysis uh, of, the, of the community, um, you know, we're going to get a unique thumbprint for Berwick. Now we take that thumbprint and we're going to take that and match it back to our database of over 5,000 different retailers. Now this database, keep in mind, is not just national brands. I understand the uniqueness uh, that the town has and the footprint that the town has. So it's more of regional brands uh, that we're going to be looking to go after. More of unique concepts that you won't find uh, you know, more nationally, but maybe only in New Hampshire or Maine or Massachusetts that only have two or three locations. Those are the folks that we want to go after. Uh, for the town. So keep that in mind. I know there's a lot of national brands there, uh, but we're going to take your thumbprint uh, and we're going to identify out of the world of retail who would be the best fit for the town. Now, once we've identified who those folks are, we're going to share that with local leaders and you're going to give us a thumbs up whether or not these are the type of retailers that we envision for the town. And once we get the thumbs up and we know that these are the right type of retailers for our town, we're going to start creating the market validation uh, and the information, the answers that we need to go after these retailers. And as I mentioned before, to make a compelling case on why they should locate into our town. Uh, so we're going to put all of that information together, pursuit packages, contact information, everything that James and Steve would need to go, go after those retailers uh, and put Berwick in the best light possible when it comes to retail recruitment. Um, now I wanted to jump into our platform. I think it's very uh, beneficial if I just show you uh, just a little bit of uh, what the tool actually is. Um, 
uh, once we we've done the comprehensive analysis once we created the pursuit packages we take all of this information and we put it into a tool called scout now what scout is is an economic development tool which houses all the data all the pursuit packages and all the information that scott uh, um, james and steve would need uh, for economic development so i'm going to jump in that tool and talk through that a little bit further i'm going to have to move over to the desk to do that as i'm as i'm logging into this uh, tool is there any questions just from the background or the the methodology of identifying the right type of retailers for the market uh, yeah. not specifically at this time <laughs> are you compiling do you access google data, data as well from phones and things of that nature so so we do have the capabilities to uh, leverage gps data as mm -hmm. well okay um so now I'm jumping into this tool called Scout, which is a very powerful analytics tool. All of our retail partners um, have access to this tool. All of our community partners also have access to this tool. It's a web-based platform. So anywhere you have a Wi-Fi connection, you can have access. So anywhere you have a Wi-Fi connection, um, you can have access to this tool. And as I mentioned, this is the, this is the tool where we will upload uh, that playbook for retail matches and also upload all of our data which you will have access to. So uh, no longer you will, have, <laughs> you will need to go out and purchase data uh, for any different reporting or any different studies that you are looking to do. You have access to Scout and Scout houses over 300 different data sets uh, that you can leverage that, uh, this tool for data. Um, I can show some of the capabilities and the features that Scout has. Um, I can come in here and start drawing different boundaries, different uh, markets that I want to look at, whether it's city limits, whether it's counties, DMAs, zip codes, I can look at that. I can come in here and look at different points of interest, whether it's hospitality, tourism, I can pull up anything, hotels, recreation areas, stadiums, convention centers, casinos. I can come in here and identify all of the retail centers in the area, whether it's super regional centers where typically you will find your mall, uh, neighborhood centers, community centers. Then I can come in here and pull up all of the businesses within my market or surrounding my market. We classify that or we categorize, categorize that uh, from 25 to 50 employees all the way up to your 500, Fortune 500 companies um, that have uh, over 200 employees. Anything that I pull up on the map, you can hover over that and it will tell you exactly what business uh, that specific icon is. And I can also click on that business and it will tell me a little bit more information on how many employees work there, what specific uh, business that is. Um, and anything that I'm pulling up on the map, you know, these are features that would help James and Steven on, on making a, a more compelling case to any businesses, any different prospects that they're currently talking to, and putting more market validation and answers uh, into why those specific businesses, or whether it's a developer that they're talking to, and that developer wants to know certain criteria or certain variables uh, within the market, within the region, or within the state as a whole, they can come into Scout and start pulling all of this information up uh, within seconds to get those answers. From education, we can pull up all the schools. Uh, we also have a ton of healthcare data within uh, this platform. Um, so we can uh, run different reports on healthcare demands. Uh, what are some of the leakages that we have in healthcare? So meaning uh, if we need more dental offices, if we need a chiropractor, uh, if we need more physicians, we can come in here, run those reports, and start pulling healthcare data uh, together uh, to go out and speak to that type of business as well. 
transportation data, up-to-date traffic counts, give us an idea on, we'd have to zoom in a little bit here, but give us an idea on traffic, uh, which way those traffics are, uh, that traffic is going. Uh, we can even um, identify from eight to five or, or, you know, change the time range of the traffic counts. Let me pull that up here. So we can see here downtown, uh, 6,000 cars daily driving by. We can also, um, as I mentioned, change the time range. If I wanted to see just my lunchtime customers, 11 a.m. to 2, we can see how many cars are driving by uh, during lunch as well. And I know um, James mentioned to me before uh, this presentation today that he's doing a traffic study. Um, you know, any, any types of studies or data that the town currently has or is looking to do, we can also upload that information into Scout so that way you can visualize that data, uh, not just have that on just in a binder form, but you can actually visualize that data into Scout. Very quickly here, um, I mentioned different reporting capabilities that Scout has. You can come in here. If we're looking at just Berwick's political boundaries, I can come in here, right-click, create a different report, and there's a number of different reports that Scout allows you to do. Consumer propensity report gives us an idea of the type of brand preferences that each one of the consumers have here, um, has here in the town. Uh, so we can identify, uh, do the wives prefer red wine or white wine? Do the kids prefer uh, to run around in pampers or huggies? Uh, that granule of information uh, that we can leverage in the conversations that we have um, and going back to the grocery store example um, you know we can put together the the reporting capabilities that is necessary to um, that those grocery stores are wanting to see so that way they know that their products that they carry is going to be moving off their shelves uh, up-to-date demographic reporting historic um, uh, historic present um, future demographic reports, uh, green awareness, uh, as I mentioned, healthcare demands. We can type, we can run different reports on healthcare. Uh, one, of the mo one of the biggest reports that, or one of the best reports that we, um, we leverage during conversations with retailers is a retail leakage report, uh, which I, I ran before the presentation today. And uh, you know, if we look just in pol the political boundaries of Berwick, as we all know, there's not as many amenities as uh, Summersworth or the, our surrounding market. Uh, so we see there's a huge leakage in just about every category, whether it's clothing, um, dining options, uh, grocery store, food and beverage, you name it, there is a leakage. A lot of our citizens are traveling outside of our market to do their shopping, to do their dining. So, you know, what, what we're looking to do with our solution, uh, with this approach is you know attract the right type of retailers that we know is going to be successful so we can begin to keep those local dollars local and not have um, our citizens have to drive 20 15 30 minutes away to do their clothing or to do their shopping to do their dining so any port any of the reports that we run um, could be accessed right here in scout you can view those reports download them send them off to whoever you'd like uh, another another feature that I wanted to quickly highlight is, uh, as I mentioned, all of the retail matches will be uploaded into Scout. So um, please excuse the national brands here. As I mentioned, I know that we are looking to identify more local Wait, and is unique. This, is this saying these are fits for Berwick? No, these these are th this is just a demo. This is just a demo site. So, so so this is just a demo site. So. Um, Please take a note of that. Okay. But let's just say that um, we we have identified that Starbucks is a good fit uh, for for Berwick. So behind each one of these icons is going to be the answers uh, that Starbucks is going to want and need to know specific to their brand on on why they should locate into the town rather than anywhere else. So we can come into Scout, click analyze, and then. Start looking at the different features that Scout or that that specific brand is going to want and need to know, uh, such as where are all my existing locations in the region, uh, and more importantly, where are all my potential customers um, located. So you can pull up their potential customers here. Um, you can pull up their competition. Um, 
directly here in the region. Obviously, this is just demo, so um, this, this competition may not be uh, similar in this area. Uh, but more importantly, as I mentioned, we have the pursuit packages for each one of those retailers uh, that we have created to give Stephen, to give James the confidence to go up to those retailers and put Berwick in the best light possible and, and already know that, hey, you know, we're not just another community that's reaching out because we like your brand or, you know, we think that you'd be a good fit. We're a community that has already done our homework. We've done the analysis. We partnered with Buxton, a third, buy, a third party unbiased market validation firm, and we know that you could be a good fit for our market. And here is the reason why, and here's the data and answers why. So we can click on pursuit package. These pursuit packages are 12 page reports uh, that is custom to that specific brand. Um, there's a number of different reporting capabilities in here, um, different graphs, uh, different numbers to show why that Starbucks is, is going to be a good fit. One last thing that I wanted to show in Scouts. I know we flew by a lot of the uh, a lot of the capabilities, but really, one last thing that I wanted to show. Uh, as I mentioned, we'll have all of the contact information for that specific brand already, so you don't have to go out and Google or or figure out who to talk to to. Um, for that specific brand. Uh, we have a team uh, back at home that upda updates uh, this information on a weekly basis so we know exactly who to contact for the specific region uh, uh, for that specific brand. We'll have their office number, their cell phone number if we have it available, their email address. Um, so let's just say that uh, we contact um, Michael um, and then we can also log the information, log the, um, the notes, log the, the you know, the communications that we've had with that specific retailer, um, are the conversations positive, are they negative, just being able to um, have a, a management system that we can continue to update local leaders on the conversations that we're having with retailers on, you know, on a bi-monthly uh, bi basis or what have you. So that is, I know, I, like I mentioned, I know I flew by Scout uh, very quickly here. It's a very powerful tool. As I mentioned, all of our retail partners leverage this tool. All of our community partners leverage this tool. Um, this is, as James mentioned, you know, uh, by not having an economic development director, this acts as your economic dire director. And, you know, throughout this whole process, uh, Buxton, we don't go away. We're there throughout the whole process. We're continuing to evolve this strategy, continuing to figure out ways not only for retail development, but what are other areas uh, in Berwick that we could help leverage the data, leverage the answers that we have, whether that's uh, for health care, whether that's for workforce, whether that's for, um, I know we, we had the school superintendent here, so there's a number of different data sets that we can leverage for different areas here um, in Berwick as well. So I'm going to go back to the presentation and sum up uh, the presentation today. I want to apologize if I've been talking very quickly. I want to be respectful of the time that I have up here. So um, as I mentioned, that is a Scout. Uh, you'll have access to Scout. Um, this will be your economic development tool. Um, and and we'll, we'll have the account management team train uh, local leaders on how to leverage this tool and how to evolve the strategy and how to get the answers that they need for any specific uh, questions um, for the town. I'm going to fast forward here all the way up to our business retention uh, capabilities. As I mentioned, this is equally as important to attracting new retailers is helping our local businesses to grow and strengthen as well. Uh, so there's a number of different reporting capabilities within Scout that we can leverage, uh, such as that those consumer profiles to better understand what customers uh, do we have here in the market for those specific brands, those local businesses that are already on the ground today. What are some of those retail leaks? 
leakages that we're seeing. Uh, we can provide that to our local businesses. Uh, demographic reporting capabilities, provide that to our local businesses. Uh, and then quickly, I want to jump into our tool that I mentioned earlier, the local store marketing tool. So this is a very powerful tool, which the town will have um, 25 licenses for this tool. They're able to distribute this to uh, any of their local businesses for free. What this tool does, as I mentioned, is a local business owner can type in the specific business that they have, type in their services, the product offerings, and then what LSMX will spit back out is the core customers specific to that business. And you can see here uh, the red dots on the far left screen here, maybe this this one's a little bit better, but the red dots on the map represents the core customers specific to that local business owner. Um, so that way they can create more of a highly targeted marketing campaign. So rather than just, you know, um, putting my uh, a marketing campaign on a local bench or putting it on the back of a t-shirt, they can now create different marketing campaigns through this tool. Uh, once they've identified their customers, you can create a campaign through Facebook, Google search, banner ads, um, direct mail pieces, or even an email um, that they can send out to their core customers specific to their brand and they're able to track the results of those marketing campaigns uh, throughout the whole process because the last thing that I want to do is create a Facebook ad uh, and nobody clicks on it right so you can track the results make sure you're getting the click rates make sure you're getting the uh, coupons uh, printed out that you've uh, created uh, for your customers so this is a tool absolutely free um, and it positions local businesses to really be able to spend their marketing dollars more effectively and efficiently so I want to sum everything up that we talked about today um, and, and really sum up the conversations that uh, I've had the privilege in having with um, Town Manager Stephen, uh, Planning Director uh, James, and also I know Tom, we, we had the opportunity to meet last fall as well. Uh, but everything that I've talked about today and you know, creating an economic development strategy for Berwick that's going to be more proactive, more data driven, um, it's because of that retail background that we have and truly understanding how each one of those retailers make their site selection decisions, having a database um, that allows us not only to target national brands but also local regional brands that is going to be the best fit for the market and taking that data driven approach um, and understanding how each one of our citizens that live, work, and play in our community, how do they live their lives, how do they spend their money, and getting the answers that we need to put Berwick in the best light possible to start seeing amenities come into the community, um, and rather than waiting for developers or brokers to, to bring those retailers in, we want to position local leaders to streamline that process and, and really give them the, the tools and capabilities that they need to go after those retailers. And it's with that scout platform, with our ongoing support of account managers, Managers, who's going to be your retail and data experts throughout this process. Uh, they're available every day um, uh, of the partnership, well, Monday through Friday at least, um, but they're there every day. They've worked, we've We've worked with over 800 different communities. We've seen it all. We've worked with unique communities that have less than 2,000 in population. So we truly understand what it's like to work with a um, smaller footprint community and trying to attract those smaller footprint type um, amenities. So. I want to thank you all for allowing me to uh, present to you all today on who we are as a company, the services that we have, uh, and, and the unique opportunity that we have here to um, to to uh, bring Berwick's economic development goals to life with the right type of um, capabilities. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, they know everything good. about us. <laughs> they do. Yeah, I mean, if they're taking your data, you might as well use it, right? Yeah. You might as well use it for town. So. Um, thank you for that. Is uh, you know a lot of information. I'm glad we were able to get it over the over the television station here to you know let the people at home you know see something about it. Also, um, any questions from the board for Chris? Or? No. no. <coughs> a lot to digest. I think it's yeah. Yeah. A lot of information very quickly, but uh, yeah. very.
impressive. Right. Well, I, I thank you all, and I completely understand it is a lot of uh, a lot of information, uh, and I pr provided some brochures that talks a little bit more in detail to the things that we've covered today, and I've also provided my card uh, within those brochures. Please don't hesitate to reach out uh, via email, via call. If you have any questions for me, I would love to um, uh, continue the conversations with you all. And like I mentioned, I just thank you for the opportunity to uh, present Bucks in a day, and um, I hope we can continue these conversations. I'm sure yes. we will. Thank, yeah. you. thank you. Thank you, Chris, very much. All right. I'd like to hear you coming this week. Yes, I'll go into that. Yep. And, uh, the Eastern Shore of the Yeah, I think, we've, I think we may have given him one of the brochures, but um, if we have it, we will this week. Did we get, didn't we give Mark one of the, these brochures? Um, he was, we talked with another developer. Another I think developer. we talked with Mark about it. So okay. I will, certainly. Yeah. Hey, um, and anything on the unfinished business? No? Is town manager's report? Uh, we put out the uh, Estherbrook bids again, um, and I met with a uh, mandatory pre bid meeting on Monday. We did a walkthrough. We had two more uh, demolition people come, very interested in presenting something. That bid closes on the 23rd, uh, so we should have three people submitting bids. Actually, one from New Hampshire and two from Maine. Um, that will be on your agenda for the 28th to award that <coughs> bid if we get any. Uh, paving bids also went out. Um, those were due, will be due in on Friday the 24th, and um, those will be on the agenda for approval. Mm -hmm. We've, as I said in my report, we've listed uh, quite a bit of work. Hopefully we can bring them in for what we have for funding. Uh, Mark Cahaya will be here. At least we haven't heard he wasn't, but he said he'd be here the 15th and 16th. I know there are several of the contractors that we had mentioned before um, are trying to set up meetings with him. Uh, I did get some, we spoke with uh, Les Bodwell this week. Um, and oh, was it last week? This week. Last week. Last week. Sometime. Yeah, sometime. <laughs> Trying to keep track of them all. But, um, and also, uh, Great Falls got back to me, um, and they're going to hopefully try to schedule a time to meet with him within the next couple of days. Um, James and I, uh, James has put together a presentation for CATS, which is our uh, York County uh, Transportation MPO. Uh, we're hoping to get on the list for 2022 for a grant to implement some of the traffic study uh, recommendations that they've made. Um, and hopefully Berwick's name will be on the list for that. Uh, we haven't seen a lot of that money come this way over the last 10 years and we're anxious to see it come here. Um, I also got an updated uh, report from the MDOT on the Ridland Road Bridge, Diamond Hill Bridge, and it's a large culvert, I guess down on one part of uh, Ridland Road. Uh, the, the reports on the two major bridges are continue to not be very good, so it's something that we have to start looking at. Each one, they, uh, I had an uh, engineering group come in several years ago when we first got them, uh, it was probably around half a million dollars for each bridge. The state has a program where it's a 50-50 match if there's funding there, so we'll start looking at that. Uh, we have a lot of big ticket items coming up. Um, when isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it just seems like there's a lot more lately. Um, the heating system, um, you have a $70,000 furnace here that's been here for five years or six years. Um, we've, over the last two years, we've been replacing the old cast iron pipes uh, in the building. Um, it's, every time we fix one, a leak pops up someplace else. Uh, so I've had the company who has been servicing us, which is Pine Tree Services out of Biddeford, or they were out of, actually out of Westbrook, but they purchased the Biddeford Eastern uh, Mechanical, uh, which was doing a good job. They gave us a proposal to um, change over the heating system and, and do some other things. Where you're looking at you know, $60,000, $70,000. I had somebody else come in today, Thermodynamics, um, to give me a, an idea. Uh, his recommendation was to, there's a lot of different options we could look at, I guess, at least several that we talked about. His recommendation is to consider hiring a engineer 
to really look at this building completely and have them give a proposal of what it would cost, what needs to be done here to get the most efficiency. We did talk about heat pumps, which seemed like a good option. Uh, if they decide it, we want to just replace the uh, heating material, the heating pipes, it's a big ticket. It's a very, very expensive project, and that means um, pulling out the old stuff, which means they have to break open some of the walls to get the stuff out. Uh, the radiators are old uh, you, um, throughout the building. Um, and 1938. 1938. <laughs> so that's something that's on the radar that we have to really seriously look at. Uh, so uh, I'm going to start looking for an engineer and get a price for uh, coming in and taking a look at it. Uh, we spent, I'm not sure how much money recently, but upwards of uh, probably 10000 in the last two years just to replace pipes and clean up the damage after the fact. You know, unfortunately, poor Kim, her office has been the one that's hit the worst. It's at least twice we've had leaky pipes in there, maybe even three. And the last one, one of them was in the copy room where all our electronic stuff is. I don't want that to happen. And now we have one in the ladies' room where it's leaking. We shut the furnace off, uh, so it's not operating anymore. Um, it's been a little chilly lately. No, it's cold. <laughs> but, um, so anyway, that's what we're up against um, coming into the future. Um, and we'll, we're probably going to have to have a workshop once I get all these things together to sit down and talk about what the best direction is and where the money's going to come from. Um, the auditors are in the building. Today was their first day. Uh, they were here all morning and most of the afternoon. They'll be here again tomorrow and also on Thursday uh, to just do the preliminary stuff. Um, Jack's been running up and down the stairs and sending lots of, you know, information to them. He's kind of holy cow. There's a lot. Of, they want to see a lot of data. He says, yes, they do. <laughs> so uh, that's what's happening there. Um, we have to talk about the meetings on June 11th, that's election day. Uh, do you want, you don't, do you want to hold a meeting on June 11th that day? Um, no, it is, so we had talked last week, it was, I can't remember the specifics, but it was something that we needed to deal with that we thought we might need to meet the first week of June. Do you remember what that was? I, I, it was a conversation I had with you last week, but I, I just remember, you know, in passing we said something I Coming can't. up, but the, the, we, have, we have a couple weeks. Uh, it'll to come up but. tomorrow morning, I'm sure. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, if that's a if that's an option, we could do uh, the first meeting first Tuesday in June. That might be a better yeah. time. I'm, as always, with finance offices, we're making sure we get our warrants signed, so we can get checks out to everybody for right. services and things like that. So I'll look at that date and I'll try to. It's just a lot of things going on. Um, but that might be a better option. We, I have tried to plan a workshop with the planning board um, and also envision Berwick for the 18th of June. Um, that's a, a off Tuesday. Uh, we have a lot of things to talk about. I, we need to, James and I have been talking, the traffic study will be done by then. We really <coughs> need to refine what we want to try, what we think we should be doing with that so we can uh, have I think some of the traffic study is pretty black and white for the Sawmill Hill Road and, and, and where Kenny Buck Savings is in that intersection. We're all in agreement that looked at that, that, that that's what we need to do there, but really the one that's in question is what we're going to do down on this part of town. Um, so uh, we need to talk about that and there are some other things, uh, but we need to really find, get some definitive answers on what, how we want to move forward. So I've invited the sewer department to that as well. Uh, they have a whole new um, cost associated with uh, hookups, which has been a lot of complaints by some of the people who are businesses that have come into town. It's very cost prohibitive. Um, the Valerie, who is here at one of our workshops, she works for Underwood Engineering, has put together a whole uh, pricing formula that's been used other places. And, Lisa, who's on the board, has talked to me a little bit about it. It makes perfect sense. It's much more palatable because it's a calculation that is, makes sense. So and this the, is what they're not using currently? This, that is what they're not using currently. Okay. They'll roll that out. Uh, 
fairly soon, I hope. Um, but that's all I have. I'll, we have an executive session. I'll go into details on that on uh, uh, land purchase. So, any questions? Any questions for Steve? Oh, thank you. Thank Thanks, Steve. Yep. Uh, I have no communications for the selectmen. That brings us to accounts payable. <clears throat> Account payable warrant 1943 for April 25th, 2019, for the amount of $156,174.05. A water warrant 0943 for April 25th, 2019, for the amount of $3,000. $684.74. Account payable warrant, 1944. Oh, I wish Steve Conley was still here. <laughs> <laughs> Account payable warrant, 1944 for May 2nd, 2019, for the amount of $727,060.90. <clears throat> Water warrant, 0944 for. May 2nd, 2019, for the amount of $3,252.40. A payroll warrant, 1943, for May 2nd, 2019, for the amount of $56,198.26. Account payable warrant, <coughs> account payable warrant, 1945 for May 9th, 2019, for the amount of $116,182.16. The water warrant, 0945 for May 9th, 2019, for the amount of $5,953.99. And payroll warrant for May 16th, 2019, payroll warrant, 1946 for two for May 16, 2019, to the amount of $51,796.21. Uh, make a motion that we pay our bills. Missing one. Yeah. Missing one. Uh, one Payroll one. Four five. Um, stick together here? Yeah, it must be stuck together because I remember seeing it. Account payable warrant, 1945, is that the one? Yeah. For uh, May 9th, 2019, for the yep. amount of $116,182.16. Oh, we've got a, we've got a duplicator. It's a payroll warrant. Payroll. Right? Yeah. Payroll. payroll warrant. May 9th. May 9th. Oh, there we go, the payroll one. Yeah. <laughs> Down there. All right. There's a payroll warrant, 1945. For May 9th, 2019, for the amount of $56,546.45. Now we'll make a motion that we pay our bills. I second it. <laughs> Any discussion? Oh. All those in favor? Thank you. Brings us to new business. And I'm going to bring up the bus petition for Pine Hill Mobile Home Park because Andrea has been very, waiting very patiently. Is um, explain a little bit to us as what it's about. Okay. Well, um, I've been thinking that some of our uh, people that live in our park are elderly, and some of them don't have cars and they don't want to drive. So I think um, the coast bus could come a little further up the road and pick up people. And I talked to the, uh, first of all, I called Coast Bus. I, call, I talked to Mike. He's the operations yep. manager. And uh, he said this was the first time he had heard of it, you know. So I got some other people to call him. So, um, and they did, and he was very receptive to them. And then I started thinking, well, uh, well, one of the... Um, people that lives in our park said, why don't you get a petition going, Andrea, because if you give names, sometimes that's better, you know? So we have 74 mobile homes in that park, and I would say 80% are elderly. And uh, we have, um, some are single, some are married, you know? So uh, myself and Marlene went around and took um, names and phone numbers and 
if they wanted to do this. And most, I would say, 80% of them did. You know, we have some that are moving right now. We have some young people, not too many, but they don't care, you know. So um, then I talked to Steve and see what he thought about it. And he thought it was a good idea. And he said that he would talk to somebody at Coast Bus. But he told me, Tom, that you're on the board. So <laughs> I'm going to push you. <laughs> I'm push you. <laughs> so, I, but I was nice. I said, well, I don't want to talk. Uh, call Tom at home. This is oh, business. Anytime you want, Andrea. Anytime. I'm going to wait till we have a meeting. And he told me when the meeting was. So, um, like I said, we have all these names. And um, he uh, told some of the people about what the cost would be for us uh, to get on there and whatever. And um, then we had a couple of girls that said, you know, this is a private park, which is which it is, you know. Um, Craig Terrian owns it, and he has to give the okay. So he was in Florida, so I had his secretary call him to see if it was okay, and he thought it was a good idea. But he said if there's any resolutions and stuff, he wants to be involved in it. And um, he's supposed to come home either within the next couple of weeks. So I'm hoping when we have our Coast Bus meeting, when they come in here to talk to us. Right, Steve? Do you know when they are yet? No? No, he hasn't gotten back to me. Oh, he has gotten back to me. And he'd like to set up a meeting. Uh, and he's got a bunch of regional meetings, again, he's, they're doing because it's just a lot of changes, I guess. Right. With the bus service and, and the needs are, are increasing. Uh, well, but I was at Covered Bridge Manor last Friday um, doing some volunteer work. And uh, I saw a little, um, well, I call it a little bus. It probably would fit, I would say, 20 to 30. You know, it was just in that manner. And they've got 17 apartments there. So I was thinking, we wouldn't need a big bus, you know, like I see out here, which they come, and sometimes there's only two people on that bus, which I think is a waste of money. It, it, the, but the, that's my personal opinion. Right. So <clears throat> if we could have a smaller bus. And the only thing that Craig said that um, he thought it was a good idea, but they got to come to the first entrance of the park. He won't let him go at both entrances and go around the park, you know. So I had to say that, you know. I thought maybe they could come in one entrance and go out the other, but he said he really doesn't want it, you know. So we it, have to respect it, it, him. It, you know, it is, I, I have discussed this, you know, before, you know, expanding the bus routes in Berwick. Mm -hmm. You know, there's been a big push for getting the bus route, need for getting, the, getting the bus to stop at the library. Right. And, um, is you know is and this goes in with the the size of the buses that they use also right. but is we have to understand that we're part of a system right. and the system is run on very tight time schedules mm -hmm. so is they they have to figure out their route their timing you know right. in order to do it and he said you know one of the things if we if we were to add stops in Berwick we might have to take some away from other Spots in Berwick, so that's just one of the issues. But I, I think this is a good idea. Is I, I, I will bring it up with Rad and, and Mike when I see them next. Well, and where else do they stop in Berwick, Tom? Um, they stopped here. They stop well up where Magawanda was. There's a stop in between here in Magawanda. They stop at the cemetery. Lord's Lord well, Cemetery. Yeah, at, uh, at the intersection with School Street, where Cumberland Farms is, mm -hmm. there's a stop up on where the Memorial Park is, Lord Cemetery. There's a park on there's uh, two stops on Sawmill Hill, I believe. You know, is um, so. You no, know, most people see the bus stop once or twice. Once or twice, right. and right, and so, right, and I saw uh, it turn around up there at the Y. Right. You know? And I thought, well, why can't they go up a little right. bit further? Well, it, 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 um, I, this is something I'll, I'll bring up with, with, with Rad and Mike when I, when I see them. Is I should know when my next meeting is, but I don't. It's coming up probably in another week or two. Right. Is, uh, we usually have the last week. Well, he, uh, Mike had said that he thought 
they were going to have a meeting with you guys either at the end of the month or the beginning of June right. in that time frame. Right. So, yep. exactly. so you let me know. I will oh, well, most definitely let you know. That's right. <laughs> and, 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 and you, 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 you can call me at home anytime you want, Andrea. That's why I'm I here. I do that. I that's why that's I'm here. Right. But um, so hopefully, you know, they help us out because there is a lot of L and there is a need there. Right. Yeah. If it, if they saw how many people just were at the library who are of all different ages, but a lot of our elderly residents, um, that would be awesome to get people there because right now we don't have sidewalks. That's another thing from our mobile home yeah, park right. all the way down, yeah. we don't have sidewalks either. They're playing for it, believe me. Ash, you can yeah. talk to James. Yeah. We, yeah. We're trying to find a way to fund it and get it done, so well, it's on the radar. High on the radar. Yeah. So uh, back back in the mid '90s, we originally had plans to bring the sidewalk all the way up to the Pine Hill Mobile Home Park. That's when we did the extension up to Knox Lane, is and and beyond from Knox Lane on to uh, well Pine Hill Terrace used to be. Is uh, the plan was to bring it all the way to the Mobile Home Park, but funding priorities. I know, I know. So. I, I I just think. And this is my personal opinion again. Berwick needs to do something for their seniors. Yep. Like housing and stuff like that. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Appreciate it. Um, we have a resignation letter from Lisa Houston from the sewer, for, from the sewer district board of trustees. I thank the Burrup Board of Selectmen for their trust in my ability to fulfill my responsibilities. I have tried my best to be upfront, transparent, and improve the communication between the sewer board and the town. I am not seeking a second term on the Burrup Sewer District Board of Trustees at this time, so my position will be vacant after June. Lisa Hustis. So, <clears throat> I guess we uh, need a motion to uh, accept the resignation, Lisa. Is, is this is a resignation letter or is this just a uh, well, it, notification it, it, that she's not going to go up for another yeah, term? Yeah. yeah, I wouldn't accept it. Yeah, Where's the feedback that coming make from? Her, make her go. Yeah, oh, you tell her it's, that. It's <laughs> to be filled by June. Oh, by the end of June. <laughs> it's not. It's not immediate. We're right, keeping so, her there as long as we can. Uh, so, and uh, the third thing on new business is impact. Did you fees. vote to accept it? Um, well, is it? Are they too? Is it a resignation? She's not, she's not running. It's not a real resignation. No, she's just just not. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> Tell me we didn't shut it. I said no. <laughs> she has to go. Yeah. We we do have somebody that I've reached out to, Kevin Gray, who's always served in the Vision Berwick for a while. Yeah, he, he had his name in last He had his name, name in last time. He, he, didn't, he wasn't here. That's yeah, why he's a financial him. guy. He's working with some of the local businesses. He'd be a great fit because he's, he's got a finance background. I think yeah. that would help. He kind of would fill Lisa's seat. Um, he'd be a, a plus. Okay. So I'll, I'll send him out another email and, and yep. recruit him. Okay. Um, impact, fees. impact fees. We've been spending quite a bit of money up on uh, Memorial Field. We've had to replace the roof at the main building uh, <laughs> with the storms and age. Took down several of the um, dugouts and that's infrastructure, so we've replaced that. Um, we've spending some money up there, which has been needed. Um, so. We didn't really budget for all this stuff this year, for but it's not just recreation. Um, I thought we could, you know, use impact fees for that. Um, a lot of the stuff has been done by volunteers. Um, the the <coughs> dugouts were built by volunteers. We supplied the material. Um, uh, we purchased materials for the infields from sports fields, um, and that group did a great job. They pulled all the weeds out. They cut the. Um, edged all the uh, infields like they should be and spread the material out. It really made a big difference in, in that area. And I was up there one uh, night when the ball fields were going on, games were going on, and boy, that place was alive. It is alive. 
And, and all of those uh, structures have been built to code, if I believe. Yes, yeah. Dan has been out to every one of them, <laughs> right. believe me. Uh, they've had to go back and do, make a few changes, but he's, he's been good with them. He's guided them through what needs to happen. And they were enclosed, which is kind of interesting, the older ones. Mm -hmm. So when the wind came through, they had no place to go right. except try to lift the building. So this time they, they made sure that they were... Uh, spaces in the top and the bottom of the so the air can get through so they've done a nice job and they've painted them and they look real good so and we're keeping an eye on that right um do you have a i don't have all the invoices yet? yet i just wanted to give you a heads up uh, once i i want to wait and get them all together so and present them so good yeah um Go ahead. Well, I'll just say I like to appreciate all of the effort that, from all the volunteers that, yeah. that went out there to make yeah, that happen. They have a new president, and they're very, very active. Uh, yeah. And uh, it's already, one of the volunteers took time off from his job. He was up there with his saws and cutting away. And yeah, they did a nice job, nice group. And the kids are having fun, which yeah. is the best part. <laughs> all right. Um, we have no quick claim deeds. We did our abatements. Second public comment. Any public comment? Ken, you don't have anything to say today? No, no. Uh, <laughs> is, uh, is, we do have an executive session. Is uh, We have no other business than non agitum Yeah, and we won't be voting on this. We won't be voting on anything in the executive session. So is, um, is it, we go into an executive session and uh, we'll adjourn right after that, but there will be no business taken. Um, so under Title I, subsection 405-6C, the acquisition of real estate property, I move that we move to executive session. Second. All those in favor? Thank you. 